exclusive. I, I grew up like a savage. Now the Freeway Rick Task Force was created to capture you while you moving. Um, just to, to, to sum it up, how I seen you was, you were a very fair guy. You was not trying to necessarily be the richest. You wanted all your people to eat. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? So Absolutely. it seemed like you gave a lot of work out. You gave, just done a lot of favors, help, helped a lot of people. Um, this task force is created. Now you find out eventually that they want you dead. They don't just, well, they want to kill you. You right. running from them, they shooting at you. Right. Um, I'm thinking about these days and times, and I'm thinking about when I'm young, the fucking battering. Like, people don't understand this was urban warfare. Like, this shit is just not oh, going no, on that. They, they started then some of the stuff, taxes that they're using now. You know, right. With the, with the gear, the yeah. fire gear, uh-huh. the helmets, uh, 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 shooting somebody that didn't have a gun. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, when, when you look at it, some of the things. Planting even, dope. Even with, what planned dope what mm-hmm. happened with Trayvon Martin is a, like a, a fallout from that era, you know, yeah. where they had us labeled as dangerous. Uh-huh. You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. Uh, 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 out of their mind, crack smokers uh, or users, and and they thought that most users smoked as well. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? So they put these stigmas on us, and then the cops start to fear. That that they've been told to fear. Right. You know what I'm saying? Oh, if you see a black man, he got a hoodie on. Right. He's dangerous. Right. You know, if he's wearing a piece of gold, he's a dope dealer. Right. So these these stereotypes started and continue to flow to even up to today. I wanted to ask you because it seemed like, like I said, that you you loved your community and you always I wanted still to help. My yeah, like I still you, help you my and being and you was very to to be not educated, right, and to be illiterate up until your prison stint. You was very diverse, like like being a tennis player, you like and having to, making them relations and going outside your community and being a likable person. Like I've never heard nobody say that you wasn't a likable person. You know what I'm saying? You, you stop, talk to everybody. You very, you know, you very genuine and down to earth. Um, but something that struck me because I always think about this when I think about, I, I told Lil D this, like if the natural progression from the dope boys in the hood with money, with hip hop growing is to that you would put a rapper on or star something in the hood, like him, with, him with hammer. And then you with DJ pool, with King T? King T. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, I played for Anita Baker's first album. Wow. That probably was one of the defining points of... Uh, What's on the album? Angel? Yeah, Angel was on oh, the album. Come on, man. That was the fucking... Rapture. Come on, man. The album was Rapture. Yeah, the album was Rapture. That's, that's ridiculous, Rick. That's like... That accomplishment, if I can just do that alone, I'm done. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> I can parlay that shit I into anything. I in the book, you know, the, the whole... How, how how the whole situation came about. Yeah. You know, uh, the guy, Woody Smith, who found Anita Baker, uh, used to look out for me when I played tennis. Okay. He bought me tennis shoes and rackets. You know, sometimes I didn't have... You know, I had big holes in my shoes, and he would buy me a pair of shoes. Okay. And, uh, one day, he needed me. Mm. And I, I was there... I was able to help him, and I took care of him. That's one of them outside relationships that you was able to build, though, what yeah, I'm talking about. Yeah. So through tennis and being outside your community to this dude who helped you, you know what I'm saying, and then he needing you later on. Right. And, and, but you guys were able to create something great. That's what I like to And cover. we could have did even greater. You know, I yeah. slipped. Uh, uh, I slipped on I really slipped on hip-hop, mm-hmm. you know, because – uh, he was one of the first independent distributors in the game. Yeah. Him and Dick Griffin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they were, yeah. They were distributing independent when nobody else was. Right. And I was already on hip hop, uh, but I allowed them to divert my attention to R&B. from hip hop to the R&B, which I should have still went and did hip hop, you know, but uh, um, it was just hard for me to, to, to part with that kind of money all at one time because I just... I gave them six hundred thousand for a new Baker's album, mm. and um, DJ Pooh wanted two hundred thousand to do a rap album. So it was like, man, I just gave up six hundred. Now I got to give up another two. You know, but all right all now. of these rappers though that that they need to understand in this process under Pooh is in the pipeline. These legends we talk about now, Ice Cube, uh, a, a lot of the NWA shit. Oh, no, right? I knew when they were recording Ice Cube's album. 
Right. So I was still talking to him on the phone even when I was in prison. Mm. So um, I knew when they was recording Ice Cube's album, and I was trying to reach out to Otis and Dick when I was in prison about doing something with Ice Cube. And you knew N.W.A. when they was young, the entire group, right? I, I knew of them. I, I met E.C. after I was in prison, too. And so, um, and, and, and... Now, Dre was at that house. DJ Pooh took me over to a house. Okay. And when I went over there, all these rappers was asleep all over the floor. And they got okay. wires going everywhere. Well, Dre, when I met Dre for the first time when I got out in person, he said he was at that house that day that I came over. That's crazy. So they, what's what's the craziest shit to me? I've never seen a person with that amount of money not be a flosser. I've yeah. never seen a person <laughs> that with that amount of money that don't got some kind of crazy car all the time, the biggest truck jewels, you know. Like, I've never seen that. And for you to be that way, like, I think it's a special thing because by the time I caught wind of you was on TV when the cases was happening. Right. right? Most people did. Most people did. But this is still early on. Like, this is you with the dreads. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm looking yeah. at this guy. I'm like, he looked like he just regular motherfucker. Like, well, well, you know, the way I looked at it is that the less people know your business, mm -hmm. it's not in the business, right. the better it is for you. And I'm going fast and I'm going front and back and shit. Like, I'm going to wrap this do, up. Do your thing. We, we roll and I'm going to roll with yeah, you. But like, bland on. So uh -huh. like, what? How did you meet him, and what was his initial attraction to you? Well, well, we started. We started. I didn't start with Blando. I started with some of his underlings. You know the connection. Okay. Who, who know the connection? Who knows the connection? Okay. So it started like that. I started off with a teacher. Uh, he introduced me to a jury guy, who who knew the connection. At first, I was getting it from the teacher. Okay. And then the teacher said, "Okay, this is the guy that know the guy that know the guy." And I started with him and. And then I went to the next guy, and then uh, one of them was like, man, give me $60,000, 60, and I'll introduce you to the guy. Yeah. And um, I was willing to do that. I was willing to give him 60000 Man, that is that is crazy. So <clears throat> you paid for the connect. I paid to meet the So team. that's something that while the young kids now is talking about running off on the plug, right? You They're you tripping. paying to meet the plug. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? And then I'm going to take care of the plug. Take care of the I'm plug. We make sure the plug is good. Right. For all the time. Right. You know, we're going to take care of the plug. Yeah, absolutely. We don't want nothing to happen to the plug. Absolutely. Because if you take away the plug, then you lose the juice. Yeah, yeah. No more electricity yeah. going to come out. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And then, um, like, something that you did early on was, like, you, you helped out in the community. You helped the community centers, and you bought property. This is something that we own now. Another thing that... Uh, that a lot of people pushing now is property and buying real estate, flipping houses and all that. Like you wanted to be the motel king. Yeah, I did. Yeah. And one of your uh, motels was the freeway motel. Freeway motor man. That is crazy. Have you pulled up to that? I went by there recently. Every now and then I pass. What, what is it called now? I don't even know, man. It's, 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 it's kind of run down now. Okay. Uh, um, it was crazy how I even came up with the idea. You know, uh, uh, moms had put me out the house. Mm -hmm. She found out I was selling dope. So uh, mom was a diehard Christian. So she like, you got to leave here. So when I leave, I'm not staying in motels. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm, I got money. I'm ghetto rich. Right, right. 100000 right. 150000 something like that there. So I ain't really tripping. Motel rooms ain't for $45 a night. But I'm starting to look like $45 a night. This room ain't that big. Yeah. And a lot of nights I can't get a room because they sold out. Mm -hmm. So I was like, they need more motels, nice ones. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So um, I decided that I wanted one. And I just sat on that journey uh, to figure out how to get one. I built mine from the ground up. Man, you can, I don't believe, I believe you can teach a lot of people a lot of things. But one thing that you have is that what I call the Kobe, the Michael Jordan, that other gear. That other fact, like you said, I set my mind on getting a motel. You know, one hangup could have happened for the average person, and they would have said, fuck it. Like, I got money. Why am I still pressing to buy a motel? Yeah. You had a whole different vision. Like, Absolutely. you like $45 a night. What am I doing? Absolutely. You know, that's something that you got to be born with. That's how I feel. Like, I feel like you can't, even the fact that you taught yourself to read, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, that's that's something that you got to you gotta have another gear. Well, we got it. We got all of us had that gear. You got to tap it's, into it's it. It's a matter of us digging down in ourselves and, and making ourselves come up. So often we get 
uh, uh, a sidetrack with mm -hmm. uh, all of the things like a radio on two channels. Right. You know, you can't really understand what he's saying or what he's doing because he's not really focused on one channel. Mm -hmm. you know, he's all over the place. So uh, um, I think it's very important that we tune ourselves in to what it is that we want to accomplish in life. Something else that I find amazing because I can't wait to the full length feature film hit and not just some like because how accurate is Snowfall to you? I ain't watched Snowfall. You man. ain't watched it? I, you know, I took a knee on Snowfall. I'm glad you did. I'm glad uh, you did, rightfully so, because, like, of course they're going to miss things and sensationalize things, and that's not technically your story. That's just something that they use. It is. Bit, they bit. bit pieces and, and bits and pieces, and it probably was based... You know, uh, uh, nah, I ain't gonna say probably. It was based off my life. You had tragic events though, like you're like your mom killing her brother, right? And you seeing it. I saw that. I'm standing right next to it. Like that's a whole like a lot of people would have went through shit you went through after that and said that's the reason I am how I am. You know what I'm saying? Or I never. I just heard you talk about it like that's what it is and that's what happened. It happened. It like happened. that's how I approach life. Like life is life. Life is going to happen. You can't say what's a, you don't know what's a good life and what's not. What if I'm born in a third world country? I don't know what's a good life. Like a, a mom killing a brother might be normal. Exactly. What, it might be a brother trying to hood, sell her though. kids. Yeah. The way we live in our hoods, yeah. you know, we, we believe it's natural. You know, I thought gangbanging was natural. Right. I thought low riding and stealing cars and selling dope was all part of, you, you, you know, when I was sitting in prison, you know, you, you do 20 years, so much go through your mind, mm -hmm. and you're sitting there and you're saying, well, what if criminology would be the formula of success? Mm -hmm. How well would I do? How well would I do? And I saw myself getting great grades and all of it. Um, so then I said, well, what if you had the opportunity to learn some of these other things? Mm -hmm. You know, that um, people who mother's a doctor, father's a lawyer, uh, like I used to have conversations with my lawyer. We'd be sitting in the business room and I wanted to know how did he become a lawyer. Right. Well, his mom and dad was lawyers. Mm -hmm. So it was easy for him to speak the, the genre that lawyers speak because they spoke it around the house. But what about a kid from uh, East Oakland or, or South Central L.A. who never met a lawyer? Right. Never met a doctor. The only doctor they know is when they go in and the doctor will stick your tongue out and you check your tongue suit. And they don't look like them. Exactly. Yeah. And they don't give you any game in order to get to those positions. So it's kind of like being bootstrapped, you know, when, you, when you're growing up in these neighborhoods. But at the same time, uh, we can get out of them. I want to ask you, at what point <clears throat> did you know that the government had involvement in the drugs that you that it was actually coming from them well I, I didn't know that until I was going to trial really to the, the guy Gary Webb did, did, you, did you Gary from uh, San Jose Mercury, Mercury no. yeah yeah when did, Gary Webb broke that story uh, uh, he was hinting that it was some big stuff going on you know in my case but he wouldn't let on to what it was he was working on so you had no idea no I thought my guy was might have been part of the Corrupt cops, you know what I'm saying? Maybe the DA was doing the same thing the sheriff was doing. Yeah. You know, dope, That's stealing cool. money, you know, I, I just didn't have a clue. Uh, no way that I could fantasize me, the kid from South Central LA who couldn't read, couldn't write, couldn't get into college, would be tied into the White House. And you, and you actually, for your, so your first case was in Ohio? Yeah, my first case was in Cincinnati, Ohio. Was that the, that was a fair case, though? That was a fair case. So, my second case was in Texas. You did time for that one. Yeah, both of them. And the second one was in Texas. Yeah. Now, now, when 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 Gary Webb did what he did, like, like, how did it go from that point to you saying, like, yeah, these I was getting it from these guys. They the cops. Well, what happened is, is when I got out from doing those two cases, I got out. I was out six months. And the DEA had already made a deal with Danilo to set me back up again. Right. So when Is I that what the hundred bricks? Right. When I came home, the day I got home, he was calling me on the phone, trying to trying to get me to do a seven hundred kilo deal. Um, it took about six months before I eventually agreed to do something with him, um, and that's how that came about. Is but that case is not is that what. 
That's uh, what Chico Brown. Chico Brown is on that case. And and shout out to the queen, Maxine Waters. She was going hard for you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, she went hard. She went hard on the case. She went hard on the government. Um, and uh, she, she was instrumental in getting the law changed as well. And she still rock with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We good. Is she? Good. And I don't know if that's true, but did she um, have uh, the? Uh, she set Chico up like he run boys clubs or something now, right? Yeah, Chico. You, he used to. No, he's he's doing TV now. Oh, he's doing TV now. Yeah, yeah, he's Man. working on a reality show uh, where he's coming back to Compton, you know, uh, fixing up abandoned buildings and mm. houses and, and, and things of that nature. Well, we was together. We was together a couple couple uh, couple weeks ago. I want to get into this Bloomberg situation, before, <laughs> but, but before I do, real quick, I want to um, just let the, because, you know, I feel like our culture right now is really based off hip-hop, like everything Absolutely. we do, right? Absolutely. And I want, is the teachers. I want the kids in, the, in that generation to know the influence and the people that's around, like, Harry O is your friend. Absolutely. We were sellers in NBC. Yeah. So, you, I mean, and you knew him before the death row thing started. I did. I knew. I, I was... Probably the first one that he told about Death Row. Is that logo drawn in jail? Uh, it I looked like it. a jail nigga drew it. I saw it, it in jail. Yeah. I, I saw it in jail. Yeah. So I'm not sure if Harry drew it or if he had somebody else to draw it for him. Right. Uh, but um, it looks like a jailhouse picture. Yeah, it does. And 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 um, in that process, we all know what Death Row did and, and, and how that became. Was you down with him when it when it was like when his company was basically being taken away from him? Well, I, I was there when when they first started. Yeah, I, I was in the visiting room with him today. He told David Kenner that he was going to show him how to make more money than he ever made as a lawyer. Wow. Um, I was there when uh, Shield came for the first visit. Okay. Um, and I, I left MDC before. Uh, anything that happened when I got back to Phoenix is when I saw uh, the first record out okay seven on undercover cop and that's when I started to uh, make some moves to, to get into the record business we again. we again and then when then we uh, of course we had tied you to uh, um, uh, a butter a butter law yeah yeah Hutch. And, Hutch. and um and uh you actually threw, uh, was it the high school uh, you used to throw, uh, was it Mixed Master Spade? Yeah, Spade was, uh, Spade was home. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We threw a beach party, you know, for one of my, my car shop when we opened it up. And, okay. Uh, I think Spade and King T DJ and LL came out. That's crazy, man. Like, I just be wanting the people to know because, like, like, like we have to, as the culture, make sure that everyone know that this is Rick Ross. Right. Right. Like it's like I always said, in, in my opinion, would you have if, if the rapper Rick Ross had said, hey, you the big homie, you know, what I'm saying from the beginning, like what why, you did you contact him while you was in jail? I did. I did. And, and if he had said, hey, you the because I personally believe he was up against it at the time. He was beefing with 50. He was beefing with Floyd. And it was like he they, they needed ammunition. You know what Absolutely. I mean? And if if he hadn't have been in that position to try to prove he was a real motherfucker. Well, he could have. He could have. I spoke to him before they was beefing. Oh, so you been I spoke knew him to him before he, his record was out. Oh, so this that changed the whole narrative. Yeah, I, I didn't know him, that. I knew him before his record was out. So, I called him. He was going to a magazine out of New York called Smooth Magazine. I remember Smooth was, with the girls on it. So my boy was the editor. Okay. Smooth. Man. Okay. So I called him one Friday, and he was like, "Oh man, dude, to be in the office Monday at nine o'clock." Okay. Call at nine. I'm gonna hand him the phone. So um, I talked to him before he blew up. Before he had the bodyguards, you know, nobody was was listening to him. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's when I spoke. So to him. at in that original conversation, did he embrace it? Like, did he just admit it? Like, hey, man, big homie, I totally. I mean, he was totally. He totally took off guard. You know, my guy never told him that this is Rick on the phone. Uh, so when I got on the phone, it was like, almost like a meltdown. Like, uh, oh, man. Because cause, cause, cause Freeway, he acknowledges you. He just... Yeah, yeah, Freeway, Red Child, he wrote me a letter. Yeah, yeah, Freeway, y'all you, y'all solid. Yeah, solid. yeah. So yeah. I seen I'm you in the studio with him the other day. Okay, but so Rick Ross in that initial conversation, it was good, but as he got bigger... When he told me how much he loved me, you know, and, but you got life at this time. He thought I had life. Okay, okay. He thought I still okay, had life. Okay, okay, okay. Because that makes a difference too. Like nobody, he ain't coming home. Nobody, nobody publicized when I got my life sentence overturned. You know, uh, 
it, it's kind of like right now. Like they have me publicize the stuff that I'm doing now. You know, I spoke right. at Brown University, Stanford, UCLA, yeah. USC, and and you're talking about a guy that's if you go back and look at his school records, it probably looked like he's retarded. Right. So how you you got a retarded person speaking at Brown University? I mean. That's a 360 degree turn. That's crazy. You know, books out. I got two books out. Documentary. Two books. And Number one documentary on Netflix. Since we-